this holy invitation we have come to meet you with a holy expectation Emmanuel you are here Emmanuel we draw near everybody sing holy invitation Come to 
praise him right now. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. He was born to save us. Thank you, Lord. That's what we praise you today. Hello. I'm so glad you were able to join me today. I hope you were able to watch our devotion that aired Christmas Day as well. If you saw that, you know that we talked about the fact that God sent the ultimate gift to us. He sent his own son to be a baby who would grow up and ultimately die for our sin. From the very beginning, though, his intention was a gift swap. We talked about that last time. He offered Jesus, but in turn, he wanted us to offer ourselves back to him so that we could have a relationship with him. What an awesome concept. When we truly make Jesus Christ Savior and Lord, life changes. And I want to talk about that today. What does living based on trust in God really look like? What I want us to do is take a look at what David had to say about that in his song that is recorded twice in scripture. It's actually in the 22nd chapter of 2 Samuel and also in Psalm 18. I'm going to 2 Samuel 22, read from that version, and we will start with the first four verses. And it says, Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior, you save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. In this song of praise, David is literally taking a look back over his life, reflecting on the power and the goodness of God, on the way God had worked in his life and in his administration as king over Israel. There are a few things that we should acknowledge as we begin to look at this song. First of all, David said that God had delivered him from all of his enemies and from Saul. To me, that seems to suggest that God's power could deliver him from enemies who attacked from without, like the Philistines, or enemies that should have been friends and attacked in a sneaky way from within like Saul had done. As he reflects, David does not say that God was his strength and that he trusted in him. What he says is that God was his strength and he was the one that he will trust in in a futuristic kind of explanation. So the truth is God had modeled his faithfulness, proven his faithfulness to David over and over again, and David had decided a long time ago that he would always trust God. What an amazing, wise decision. He had made a conscious life choice a long time in the past that was still in effect. So here's the question. Have you decided already that you will trust God no matter what comes your way? We know David's life had certainly not been perfect, but he had learned well that he could and should trust in an unfailing God, not in anything in this world, certainly. Obviously, our lives like David's are full of challenges at best. And we have a very real enemy named Satan who will use people and circumstances, whatever he can, to attack us. His agenda is to dis discourage and distract us so that we are weaker and more vulnerable 
to his destructive tactics. Obviously, this church body could say Satan has been on our case for a good while. Some people got discouraged because Pastor Bell resigned. Some people are discouraged now because frozen pipes and leaks have seriously damaged our building. But I'm just going to tell you, God is no less faithful. He will be no less able to provide for everything we need. It's our job to trust him. I'm so thankful it's not my job to understand everything. I just know I need to trust God. You know, that trust is especially important when it comes to our defenses against Satan's tactics, especially in the area of our thought life and our emotions because those are so critical in keeping us on track. Now, David is going to share with us in this beautiful song some answers to some of these very critical questions that we have. So today, we want to briefly look at what he shares primarily in 2 Samuel 22 with a couple of thoughts that we will add. Here are the questions we'll address. What does God expect of us? How does God respond to our trust in him and our faithfulness to him? And what should our conclusions be and our life responses be to our responsibility and his responses to us? Let's start. What does God expect of us? What does David say in this beautiful song? The first thing we need to understand is that we need to pray. We are supposed to pray. David makes that very clear. In fact, he almost seems to suggest that there are levels of prayer intensity. I remind you in verse 4, he says, I will call upon the Lord who's worthy to be praised. But in verse 7, he says, in my distress, I called upon the Lord, there's that level, and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry entered his ears. It, it, so when I call upon him, it's like my voice. And when I cry out to him, it says that cry enters his ears ears. He hears us. He responds to us. Now we know that we have to pray in accordance with God's will and we can't harbor sin in our hearts for which we have not repented. But what an amazing concept that the God of the universe, the God of the whole of creation, hears us when we cry out to him. Why then would we not cry out? to our faithful, trustworthy God. But I'm not only supposed to cry out to him, I'm supposed to praise him. Now, back to verse 4. I will call upon the Lord. And what is the next part? Who is worthy to be praised? Verse 50, toward the end of chapter 22, says, Therefore I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. So I praise God because he's worthy. It has absolutely nothing to do with the circumstances I may face, good ones or bad ones. In fact, Psalm 34, the first four verses, make that so abundantly clear. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall what? make its boast in the Lord. It does not do us any good to brag about ourselves in any capacity because we are flawed and we fail all the time. But we boast in the Lord. That's what Paul said. Any boast he had was in the Lord. It goes on to say, the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he what? Heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Satan is a dispenser. 
of fear. It is his agenda to distract us and cause us to look at circumstances instead of at the God that we can totally trust. So I get it. I'm to pray. Call on the Lord. Cry out to the Lord. I'm to pray. It's good times, bad times, in between times makes no difference. And even though Satan, Satan may attack my mind, I am to focus on the faithfulness of my God. Now, David doesn't mention it specifically, but we're about to begin our 21-day fast. So I want to add that we are to fast because fasting is a spiritual discipline that's an important part of our lives. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said, remember, uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And he goes on in Matthew 6 to make some stipulations regarding fasting very clear. He says, moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, it didn't say if, Matthew chapter 6 says, when you pray, when you fast, and it suggests the same idea with when you give, when you are faithful. So he says here, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So, okay, I'm to pray. I'm to praise, I'm to fast. It's a spiritual discipline. I'm to fast as a part of sincere repentance. Joel 2.12 says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, not part. Don't play games with me. Don't hold back parts of yourself. Give me that gift swap that I intended all along. Let me have you turn to me with all your heart with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Okay, it's a spiritual discipline. It's part of sincere repentance. And then we fast for wisdom, direction, and answers to prayer. I send you to Ezra chapter 8, verses 21 and 23. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones in all our possessions. They need divine direction for the path they're to take. Oh my goodness, we need divine direction for every step that we take. Verse 23 says, so we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he what? Answered our prayer. Okay, pray, praise, fast, walk in righteousness and obedience to the word of God. Verses 21 through 23. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. Oh, God, help us to be able to say that. Now, does that mean David was sinless? Absolutely not. No one under the sound of my voice is probably confused by that idea. We know he sinned, but truthfully, he was a worshiper with a repentant heart whose basic life philosophy was a desire to serve God and to be faithful to the precepts of the laws of God. So he's not claiming perfection or sinlessness. He's affirming the life philosophy upon which he has built his life. Wow. He lived based on his total trust in God and his personal commitment to God's laws. That's a really good philosophy. Now, 
We know there are other things that are not included in 2 Samuel 22 or Psalm 18. We know we're to be generous givers. We know we're to be faithful worshipers who assemble regularly with believers. We know that we are to serve God as part of the body of Christ. But those expectations are a little bit outside the scope of what David shared here in 2 Samuel 22 and Psalm 18. So we will allow them to be a little bit outside of our focus today and make them topics for another time. So where are we? What does God expect? He expects us to pray, to praise, to fast, to walk in righteousness and obedience to the word of God. And there is no way you can discount the fact that that's our part. Salvation is free. It's a gift of God. But in response to salvation, we become love slaves to God by choice. That's what I've always said. Because I love him, I will serve him. Because I love him, I will pray and spend time with him. Because I love him, I will not look for ways to abuse grace and live in a way that is unrighteous and would bring shame to his name. I have certain responsibilities that are my part. If I live according to a life philosophy of trust and faithfulness, how does God respond to that? This passage, this beautiful chapter makes it clear that God saves the righteous he saves them from their enemies. Back to verse 4, which is key in this chapter. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Now, that means I think I do no disservice to Scripture when I say that calling on the Lord and giving Him the praise He deserves Putting my trust in him is key to my being saved from my enemies. Now, you're going to say, but I'm not fighting the Philistines, and there's no wicked king named Saul from whom God's hand of anointing has been removed that is after me. No, you're not. But we face very real enemies today. First of all, we live in a godless culture the whole godless culture seems to now be the antithesis of an environment that is conducive for people who are standing for truth. But I'm going to tell you that my God will fight my battles even though I live in a godless culture. If my enemy is a physical challenge, if my enemy is a financial setback, if my enemy is relationship struggles, I can still trust God in those battles. He is faithful. And David's beautiful song, and I do encourage you to read the whole thing, tells us a lot about those threats and about God's response. First of all, did you know that God is angry? when attacks are levied against his people. Verse 8 says, Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Now, whether or not heaven shook literally or that was a figurative demonstration of the intensity of God's emotion there, the point is clear that when God's people are attacked, God rises up in our defense and he doesn't stay removed from us in some lofty heavenly place where we are down here on our own. Notice what verse 10 says. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. Why? In response to the needs of and the attacks against his people. He comes to our defense and he rescues us in our weakness and our inadequacy. Verses 17 through 19 say, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me. 
for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. Do you feel like what you are facing is way too big for you and that you are totally and completely inadequate to handle it? I'm just going to tell you, when we place our faith and trust in a God who is faithful, there is no challenge too great, nor is there a need that is too small to escape his notice and he is faithful to come to our defense and to save those who belong to him who are doing their best in this wicked world to faithfully serve him and who consistently put their faith and their trust in him. He literally rewards our righteousness and our faithfulness. Verse 21 the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me. Now, I've already made it clear that didn't mean David was perfect. It meant that David was doing the very best he could. He was not abusing the grace and mercy of God. He was facing obstacles that were too big for him, and God rewarded his faithfulness with divine intervention. God, help us to see that so many times we're so caught up in the circumstances. We don't see the hand of God at work in the background behind the clutter of what's distracting us because he is faithful to us. Now, this um, song that David sang also addresses what happens when people aren't faithful who don't belong to God, who don't put their faith and trust in him. Verses 27 and 28 say, With the pure, you will show yourself pure. And with the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. You will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty, that you may bring them down. So what can I conclude here? God blesses his people those who are humble and trust in him and recognize that our, our strength is nothing. In fact, his strength is made perfect when in our weakness. But the ungodly are not under the umbrella of his divine favor. The proud and arrogant who do not humble themselves before him have no guarantee of anything but what Proverbs sets them up for, and that is a fall and destruction. So even though it's a minor point in this chapter, that distinction between the righteous and the ungodly is clear even here. Okay, so God has a right to expect certain things of us. When we are trusting and faithful, benefits come to us. So based on those two concepts, we should draw some logical conclusions and make some wise life choices and responses should indicate that. Now, let's start with some irrefutable truths about God that this beautiful song affirms. First of all, God's our lamp. Verse 29, for you are my lamp, O Lord, the Lord shall enlighten my darkness. When I don't know what to do, when I don't know what the next step should be, when I just need to stand still until he lights my path, this is something I need to recall. He is the light that scatters the darkness of my life. He's the light that scatters the darkness of this evil world. His ways are perfect and his word is proven. I can't understand his ways. They're above me, but his ways are perfect. His word is proven. It is the compass of my life. It must be the compass of our life. Verse 31 says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who what? Trust in him. There it is. He's those things to those of us who recognize that without him we're hopeless and helpless. But when we put our faith and trust in him, he comes into our lives and into the situations that impact our lives and makes a difference in defense of his righteous ones. He is our rock. 
He is our strength. He is the power that we need. Verse 33 says, God is my strength and power, and he makes my way perfect. Notice, it didn't say my way was perfect. It says he can take whatever is in my way and make it perfect, the same way that Paul wrote to the Romans, that he's able to work all things for the good of those who are the called according to his purpose. We get off track because we want things to work out well according to our purposes. We need to revert back to that idea that we have to recognize his purpose and put our trust in him no matter what. He makes our way what it should be. So let me get my head straight. We can build our lives on our trust in him and through him because of our trust and because we do our best to be faithful, we can overcome any enemy that we face. We have some undeniable responsibilities and we get some undeserved privileges. I must trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Do you trust him? Truly trust him? Do your choices and actions reveal trust in him? I encourage you to look up the lyrics of, to those old songs. Trust and obey. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Here's the thing. The only one in whom I can safely trust is God. And that means Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As we begin a new year, as we commit to a 21-day fast beginning at noon today, we need to consider our trust levels. Do we trust him? Not only to be our savior, do we trust him enough to allow him to be Lord? Do we believe that he will be the savior who delivers us from the enemies of our lives, whatever those enemies may look like? Repentance and commitment are a good place to begin, but praise should automatically follow no matter what we are facing. We should praise for God's grace and mercy, the gift of Jesus Christ, his faithfulness through the last year, even if it was hard. The certainty that we can trust him with 2023, no matter what it will hold. Certainly the fast will include a time of petitions. But let me encourage you, start with repentance and praise. Start with a grateful heart and an acknowledgement of a worthy God because he is the only sure foundation. He's the only thing on which we can safely build all of life, not just now, but eternity. It's all based on our trust in him. Will you allow me to pray with you before I sign off today? Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for who you are. I want to praise you because you are the all-sufficient God. I want to praise you and express my gratitude. God, you're faithful. Your word is sure. You make our paths perfect, even when we don't understand it. God, help us during this period of fasting, to move to a new level of trust in you, to recognize that we need to cry out to the worthy one who's able. God, help us in this time to draw near to you. God, may we not be afraid to draw close, close enough to see those areas of our lives that are not pleasing to you. God, I pray that it will be a time when we repent and we confess, when we commit and move forward, not just because of answers that we think we'll receive, but because it's our passion to have a more intimate relationship with you. God, thank you that we have this opportunity. Thank you for the God that you are. God, bless your people. Be with them. Sustain them. 
God, may they not be distracted by the challenges that have been cast into our pathway, but may their focus be on the great I am, the one who is more than able. And God, I just thank you for all of these things and ask them in the name that is above every name. And it's in his name that we pray and to him that we ask that honor go. Amen and amen. God bless. Happy New Year.